Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. I apologize for the delay in starting the show, but here we go. Search for Tomorrow began its run on CBS on September 3rd, 1951, and ran for 35 years until December 26th, 1986. My next guest spent a number of years in Henderson causing some trouble and creating some heartache along the way. I'm thrilled that they're taking the time to join me today. Please welcome to the locker room, Marie Chatham, Stephanie Wyatt, Michael Corbett, Warren Carter, and Marsha McCabe, Sonny Adamson. Marsha, Michael, and Marie. Hi, hello, Hi everybody. Thank Hi. you so much for being hello. here. <laughs> We, we were trying to get Marie connected. She's having some video problems on her end, but but truly, thanks everybody for being here. Um, we were talking backstage. You know, the the love of Search for Tomorrow is still so prevalent today. What is it? You know, Forty something, fifty years later now. It, it how many more? Did you, Marcia did the math. How, how many is it? It went off the air. Uh, Eighty six. Thirty four right? years ago. Thirty four. Yeah. Wow. 1986. It's crazy. Marie, to... While we have you, do you remember your first day? What? Marie, do you remember your first day at Search for Tomorrow? Oh, heavens, yes, I do. <laughs> I, <laughs> was, I came from California where it was warm and sunny. I went to New York where it was cold as hell, and my <laughs> feet were freezing. So in the studio, I wore big fluffy slippers to walk around in because my feet were freezing all the time. And Mary Stewart came out of her dressing room and looked at my feet, looked at me and said, and this is the sex symbol they've hired. <laughs> and went back into her dressing room. That was my introduction to Mary Stewart. That's, that's listen, I funny. would I would love to reminisce with you in just audio today, but I now have a, an audition that I have to do as soon as possible. And I apologize to everybody for, I don't know why the camera wouldn't work, but I really do have to ring off and tend to business. You go tend to business. We'll try and do this again with you, Marie, at another time. Oh, Mike, okay. Mike, and Michael and Marsha will, will uh, hold the floor. Okay. Okay. Nice to hear uh, you voice, Marie. No one Thank can you. hold the candle to you, Marie, darling. You are the best. You are the <laughs> best and the brightest, and I miss you. Thank you very much, dear. I will always be grateful to you for your lovely parting gift. She gave me a gift to our nail salon, yeah. and I said, well, you know, you, when I left the show, and I said, you always got to take care of number old 46, which was the number of my nail polish at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. And Lisa, Lisa Peluso sends her best regard. She's had a death oh. in the family oh. and she couldn't participate. So perhaps a mother and daughter show later on. That would be perfect. We, we, when we I would grow love up. it. Marie, we'll, we'll test this out another time, but thank you for at least saying hello to the fans and, and good luck on that audition. Break and away. you're very kind to me, Alan, to invite <laughs> me. And I just wanted to say thank you to Mitch Sandusky and uh, Chad Dancer and Roche B, who've been oh, very, yes. very kind to me and continued our relationship. That's very nice. Well, they, they definitely were very excited about this. And I'm sorry the camera doesn't work and I can't figure out why. <laughs> me too. But I, will, I will tell you before you go and to, to everybody, you, you're getting chow from Italy, from your fans in Italy. Oh, oh really? Wow. Yeah. Well, oh, in Italy really? it's called uh, uh, something a domani. What was the name? Spermanta domani. Spermanta domani, I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Marie, thanks so much. Spermanta <laughs> domani. Ciao. Ciao, Ciao. Marie. Ciao. Ciao. Hi, Bella. Hi. Um, that's so great. So uh, let's go back in time. Do you remember, um, you know, first, uh, Marsha hearing about the role of Sonny and Michael hearing about the, the role of Warren. And, you I know, had an in. interesting journey because, um, I, first of all, the week before I started on search, I had actually been an extra in the country club scene in Henderson. And John James was an old uh, classmate of mine from the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. So there I was in a tennis outfit, which I'm actually an active tennis player. So that was funny. And, oh, hi, John. How are you? Oh, my God. So good to see you, blah, blah, blah. 
And I had actually auditioned for um, Sonny's older sister, Lane, and I didn't get the part. And um, I happened to walk into the production office after my day as an extra in the country club scene. And just as I was walking in, Mary Ellis Bunon, the executive producer, was walking out and she looked at me and she said, mm, have you auditioned for the role of Sonny? And I went, no. <laughs> she goes, well, go into the office and, and, you know, they'll give you a side. So I went in and I was put on tape the next week and um, I got the part. So it was just, if I hadn't gone to the office after my day as an extra, I was always looking, for, I, I wanted to work. I didn't care if I did an extra, I didn't care if I did an under five. Every day that I was on set, I learned something. And so people say, you know, should I do extra work? And yes, do whatever you can do, because Michael will concur, you, you learn. Every time you're mm -hmm. on set, you learn. And uh, I've done theater. So it was just, it was just really kismet. I feel like, you know, the good Lord was looking after me and I, I was just so blessed to, you know. And, and she was quite a producer. She was, she, oh, went man, she, she was amazing. She yeah. went on to create the amazing. real world and so much, so yeah. many other lasting um, programs. Um, Marcia, it's so interesting. You, you tell that story because in just doing this show, the amount of actors who have made it and have had roles in daytime, all, mm -hmm. all had an extra role sure. on the same show at some yeah. point that they landed because of just doing it and being in someone's eyesight and, you know. But just being proactive. I mean, I was constantly knocking on the door. Hello, remember me? I, you know, I'd love to, because I just wanted to make enough money so that I didn't have to wait tables. And if I was doing a couple of extra, I did extra work on every soap in New York. From uh, Somerset to oh my God. Yeah. Love of Life, as I did, I had a running under five on as the world turns. I played um, a nurse there. I was a, a production assistant on Guiding Light for a while. I had a running under five. I just wanted to work, you know. And, and I, you know, the, the other thing too is I know I've had really good luck by just you know sometimes your, your agent will say, oh no, it's only a day, don't take it. But when I, I the very first soap job I got was on Ryan's Hope. And I was booked for a day to go in and play this character named Michael Pavel. And so that day, by the end of the day, they called the agent and went, you know, we're going to find a couple more days for him. And it kept going and going. And then, then I ended up, you know, years on that show. And once I finished on that show, I got called immediately to search for tomorrow. So I didn't audition, but they, they knew me. So I just, I think about two weeks later, right on to search for tomorrow and got thrown right in with a storyline with Cindy Gibb and, and the whole, and the whole crew. And it was, it was a lot because it was just like trial by fire. I remember that just going right in. I had maybe two days notice and boom, just thrown into the midst of it. And it was amazing. They were amazing people. I mean, we had, we had incredible people. Uh, uh, John Glover, uh, Jane Krakowski. I used to tie up, and feed her rat in one <laughs> spoon. What? You were uh, such a bad boy. Did you? Were you a nice boy on Ryan's Hope? I'm just curious. Well, I, you know, the, my sort of claim to fame was always that I would sleep with the mother and the daughter. And then I went to church for tomorrow, and I was sleeping with the two sisters. And then I went to Young and the Restless, and I married the mother and the daughter. So they always had me doing multiple women at the same time. That was sort of my, I guess that's my niche. That, that is yeah. very funny. Um, Sweet man off camera too. Anyway, go ahead. Roach, who Marie just mentioned, one of the fans, was asking Michael if you were on search more with your shirt on or with your shirt off. Shirt off. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I, I really think most of Search for Tomorrow was, was either in, in some sort of a Speedo, a shirt, but it was usually ripped. Um, crazy. I mean, it's crazy when I look back in those days, I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah, yeah. They they, they were sell, they were selling your body back then. Pretty much. <laughs> they just showed the live show again, and I think when the live show started, you were putting your shirt on. Yeah. Right? No matter what, it was always me yeah. getting yeah. a like a pink. You were wearing like a pink shirt with a, a, a pink, like a dark pink jacket, but you were putting your shirt on when the show started. That was the only. I remember. I remember that day because they I had to get my shirt on and 
the tie tied before I could leave the room. And I was so nervous because it was live. And I thought, I'm never, I'm never gonna do this. I'll never get it done. God, I remember that. So you both started when it was live? No, no. we did. So our producer at the time, Joanna Lee, decided that she had a great publicity gimmick. I mean, they claim that it, it wasn't, but it really oh. was. It was. So, um, they pretended <laughs> that we lost the tape and that we had to do the show live. And, you know, it all worked out okay, but I was upset because, A, it was, she was, it was throwing us all to the wolves a little bit because, you know, the audience was tuning in not to see if the show was going to be good. They wanted to see how it would be messed. You know, it screw up. Who yeah, was of course. Crazy, you know? I didn't realize they did yeah. a live show. Yes, I, I know they used to be live, but I didn't More realize that after they went to tape that they went because they did it much later on One Life to Live. Right. Yeah. No, they, 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 publicity thing. And Marcia, you may remember this, but what is the movie, or the fans may remember this? So I'm going to throw this out to everybody. Yeah. What is the movie where it was about the soap opera that went live? Um, is, it, is, it, is it Soap Dish? Soap Dish. Yeah. Now, so you know, Soap Dish was written by Bob Harlan, who was overseeing at Search for Tomorrow and was there during our live episode. Oh. And he wrote Soap Dish based on our live Search yeah. for Tomorrow episode. Wow. Yeah. Well, Alan, in fact, this is funny. So it was literally live from New York at Search for Tomorrow. They had Don Pardo. Do the announcement. It, the whole thing was like it was a really well greased, you know, yeah. gimmick. But and it all went well. The ratings went up that day, and then they never really went up again. But you know. did you film at two 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 East Forty Fourth? I that was our last place. Um, I started at the broadcast center. I, Michael, were you at Reeves first? And I think I was at Reeves Teletape. Yeah. So we started. At, I was at um, the broadcast center on Fifty Seventh. Then we went up to Reeves. Uh, 81st and Broadway, right oh, across the bars, which was great. And then the UE, which is where the Edge of Night was. Oh, yeah. When they vacated, um, that's when we went there. And yeah, so. And then Guiding Light ended up there yes. before, before leaving. And that building was torn down and is now some high rise apartment building, <laughs> of course. Um, Michael, did you uh, do extra work as well in soaps before, or was Ryan's your first? No, I, you know, I listen. I was really, I, I was really blessed. I was, I went to the Boston Conservatory, and and my first week in New York, I because I sing and I read that. I can't believe uh, it. my first week in New York, I got a Broadway show, and I that's what I was doing in New York when I got a call to go in and do that day on. Ryan, so, so there were times when I was doing Broadway and the soap at the same time. I should put a warning up on screen. This doesn't happen normally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what I say. I'm very, I'm very, I was blessed. Yeah, I, 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 I literally, there was a, um, Marshall, you'll remember, there was a restaurant in town called Joe Allen's. Yeah, so, yes. Still there, yeah. I was very aggressive when I first got to New York. So I got there on like a Sunday or whatever. And I went to Joe Allen's and I applied for a waiter job and they hired me and they said, come back tonight and um, you can train or trail or whatever it was. And I got the job and I was going to start on Thursday. But by Thursday, I had gotten a Broadway show and never, never had to work there. And so that was my first job. And then from there, went on to Ryan's Hope. So it was, yeah, it doesn't happen. No, it doesn't happen. What, what do you remember about just, you know, your first day on a Broadway stage, like Friday. Um, it, what was the show? What show was it? The first one I ever did was called Nefertiti. Oh, sure. Yeah. And Maria Marcovici and Bobby Nori, uh, 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 um, Michael Nori, Bobby Bobby Lapone, um, and I. It, it was just incredibly magical, and the I, I remember I was in the very first scene on stage, and I remember the orchestra playing the overture, and the curtain was was rising, and I started crying. Because I was what nineteen years old, and uh, and it was so. Like not wearing a shirt either, were you? I was not. I was in. I was in the. Dip. He was wearing a loincloth. I had a theme here, Alan. <laughs> there is a theme. That started my career. Exactly. 
Oh my god. Well, well, good yeah. thing you kept yourself in Pretty crazy when you were young. You know what I mean, or still do. But you know what I mean. Like you started out in great shape, which yeah, with 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 skills and talent, it's it's like the perfect combination. Uh, it, it got me by. It yeah. got me to where I am today. Hey, I mean, um, one of the fans was just commenting, uh, you know, loving seeing you on the cover of People Magazine back in the 1980 with Alan Dicer and Chris Bruno from Guiding Light. Yeah, yeah. Ryan's Hope was a big, that was a, there was a lot going on. It was right in the time, and Marsha, you were on, I think, One Life at the time. It was right, that was when Luke and Laura on General Hospital. I mean, it was soaps were in I their hand. After Search. I was on Search from 78 to 86, but after, that was after. I was oh, on. okay. But it was, that was the yeah. time, Marsha and I were just talking about it, where soap operas were the thing mm. in the early 80s. It was like like never again in time. It was it, they were really a big deal back then. Yeah. Well, we were just talking about Joyce Becker and Alan Sugarman's soap festivals where they were sending people all the time around the country. Yeah. To like two and three thousand people in the audience. And yeah. it was crazy. It was crazy times. It was exciting. It was really yeah. who who or what influenced you on becoming actors? I mean, you both went to some pretty darn prestigious schools, but you know, was there were you always a movie person? Were you always a theater person? What what prompted your desire to? Marsha? Well, um, starting with, well, I guess starting with um, my, when I was about 10, 12 years old, we had a, an art center that was outside my backyard in Wallingford, Pennsylvania. And they used to have a children's theater group on Saturdays. So I started doing shows then. And then when I went away to summer camp, I went to a camp that was uh, very interesting. It was a, basically a writing camp, but the woman who was the daughter of the founders was a theater actress. In fact, there was an actor on search named Carl Lowe who played Dr. Bob, and he was her old boyfriend. They used to do summer stock together in the theater. So she was very much into theater. So she hired all these amazing um, theater people, whether they were counselors or whatever. Scott Holmes, who was on um, As mm -hmm. Forever. He and I were counselors. Uh, I didn't know that. That's great. So, I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, but she had, um, you know, lighting directors from the Ridiculous Theater Company. She had all these people in the theater. So those of us who were in theater and those of us who rode, but it was a great theater place. And then I, um, when I went to apply to college, I wanted to go to a, a liberal arts college with a good theater. And so I went to Rollins in Florida, I had, they had a great theater, but I didn't really like the school. So I left and I went to the American Academy after two years. And um, that's when I met John James. And I started auditioning when I was 20 years old for stuff and started getting little things here and there. And that was my journey, but I really wanted to do theater. I didn't envision myself as a television actress, but most agents sort of, you know, threw me in that direction. And so, you know, that's why it was very important for me to do all these little things because I learned from being on set and I took a, a class at Wee Sparing, which was that mm -hmm. you know, they had an act like a television acting class back then, and that was very helpful because it's very different, as you know, you know, stage versus TV is very, very different. So, mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I just, I, I, it was something I always loved. It was sort of the framework of my life. So it was the only thing I really thought to do, you know. So I feel so lucky that I was able to forge a career out of it. That's great. I love yeah. Scott Holmes. Small I world. Isn't that crazy? I just saw him in Charleston. He's now living in Charleston. Yeah. And we've stayed in touch. You know, our paths have crossed, you know, for many, many years. And, um, yeah, I just saw him in Charleston last year. I went there for the first time and looked him up, and he's – He's doing great. He's uh, retired, but happy as a clam. And yeah, he loves it there. Yeah. And Michael, for you? Um, I think uh, for me, it was I was I went to University of Pennsylvania and I wanted to either get a degree in architecture or something, but I ended up doing all the shows. So as a freshman, I got in all the, the senior shows. A matter of fact, with a guy named David Zippel, who now has written pretty much every Broadway show out there. Uh, uh, he's got and a lot of Disney movies and musicals. So I was doing a show there, Kiss Me Kate, and oh. it was in the Hal Prince Theater. And Hal Prince came to see it. And after the show, he said, 
you ought to think about going into show business. And I literally quit University of Pennsylvania that month and I um, transferred up to the Boston Conservatory and got my degree and stayed there for three years. So that's how it happened for me. Otherwise I'd be an architect or something these days. Were you Petruchio in Kiss Me Kate? No, I was one of the suitors in ah. Kiss Me Kate. I was I was a freshman, but I Petruchio was Bianca in Kiss Me Kate. But so oh, really? <laughs> always true to you, darling, in my fashion. Yep. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you have a favorite storyline at, at search? Wow. That's well, hard. The, I there was, was, my uh, favorite storyline was probably my, it was my least happy storyline was my whole, the, they, we had an acquaintance rape storyline that was mm -hmm. very um, timely, very intense. Uh, it was, it was very, it was very hard emotionally because it went on, dragged on for months, but it was, a, it was really important. You know, I think it was an important story to tell, um, but it was not, it, you know, it was, it was not it was easy. Yeah. You must, you must have heard from fans, though, because, I mean, I think those things are um, when we, we tell socially relevant stories in daytime, it, you know, it's such an impactful way to, um, you know, just yeah. talk about those issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I it was I and I'm working, you know, I love working with David Forsyth. I just, mm -hmm. you know, he's a gem and, and just wonderful to work with every day and it, it was a very it was a really good story but it was it was very emotionally wrenching and hard and but it was an, it was important so i i and i was very honored that they gave me uh such a, a great storyline mine would probably be because i outlived three wives so <laughs> i my you didn't kill them did you i no i don't think i did i it's possible i can't remember <laughs> started out doing always doing the the two you know having an affair with the two sisters so i started with cindy gibb as my wife and then cindy left to go do fame i think it was the yeah. movie and then um they brought in elizabeth swackhammer who I, I adore and i love very much and she's a very dear friend to this day and i was telling marcia before in the green room that uh, lizzie and i work together uh to this day and um, and so we see each other, you know, often now. And then after Lizzie came uh, Terry Oaf, Terry Oaf, who was uh, um, Miss Miss uh, Texas. Yeah, I think so. Lubbock. Stunning. She had the most beautiful hair. She had yeah, she had great hair too, oh and God. she was lovely. So uh, I got to have all these three women play my my wives and then um, sleeping with Lisa Peluso at the same time, I think. So it was fun. It was, th those were, those were good for you. It's such a hard job. Somebody has to do it, I do. Somebody had to do it. Bad person and a good, I think you must have had so much fun, Michael. You just, you know, just had. Oh, it was the bad guys, or the, you know, I never call them bad because you never, as an actor, want to think of your character as being a bad guy. But the guys, like that character in particular, just, kind of was full of himself and didn't was sort of a narcissist and really didn't think he was a sociopath. Hmm. Unlike what's going on in the world today. So there's, um, he just didn't believe he did anything, was doing anything wrong. So he was having fun. He was having a good time just sleeping with everybody. <laughs> I think I was the only person you didn't sleep with in town. I, ne I never slept with him. <laughs> Yeah, but you, you had your slew of men there too. You had your slew of men, Marsha. Really, I was always I was a I was a, a, a one man woman. Once I was with somebody, I was not. I didn't have a roving eye. You know, I was pretty. I was pretty much a straight edge, I must say. But no, I definitely had some fabulous um, leading men. And in fact, um, I, you probably read one of my favorites. I actually just passed away, uh, Marcus Smythe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. That's uh, yeah. He passed away. Um, I didn't even know he was ill. He passed away about three months ago. Yeah. And I've been in touch with his his wife, and uh, it just he was quite sick for a few years, but I didn't know. I used to we used to exchange Chris birthday cards every year, and I hadn't heard from him in a while. But you know, 
things happen. I just things happen. I heard out of the blue that he had died. Actually, I think it was from. I think it was a post. I think it was Alan Brown actually who texted me. Alan, if you're listening, I'll never forget that day. I was just. He Facebook messengered me and I just almost dropped it. I was out running around with my kids and I just looked down and I went, oh my God. And it was like, I couldn't believe it. Because he was, uh, you know, he and I had spoken at length about, you know, right before he got sick. I had no idea. But it, that was a real uh, shock. But I loved working with him and I loved working, of course, with David. And, uh, and um, Doug Stevenson's another one. Who, oh, Dougie, yeah. That was another tragedy. You know, he's gone too. Yeah. I know. yeah. So mm. that's why we have to wake up and enjoy every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, the good news is, is that Marsh and I were 14 years old when we were on Search for the So we've got so much more to do. So much more. Absolutely. Um, Michael, one of the fans was asking, and I don't know if you, you know, you feel like sharing, did you have a favorite scene partner? Wow. Um, I'm well, okay. I, I have to say probably Lizzie Swackhammer as of the wives. Just we had a, such a really wonderful connection that we literally remained friends for 40 years. So, and then um, I, I, gosh, there were so many great people that we got to work with on the show. We really did. Um, and Lisa Pelosi was great. And Sue Scannell, who played my sister. Yeah. Um, we're still good friends. I love Sue Scannell. Um, Hopefully we'll get Sue to. Hopefully we'll get Sue to do that. Do this. You know, she she wanted to, but she was working on a project. Yeah, yeah. She's still involved in entertainment. What is she doing? She she was running a theater company up in um, up in Massachusetts, I believe. And then I think she was directing a project, possibly, and that's why she couldn't participate. Yeah. She was involved. She did a, soap, a Christian soap, I believe, before she started on search. Didn't she? In like in the DC, West Virginia area. I remember distinctly. Something something like that. And then, and then I, I didn't know we had such a thing. Yeah. So yeah. Local kind of yeah, but it was, it was, I said that's really cool. And then she never called Search for Jesus. Ah <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other thing. Um, um, sorry, yeah. Marie shared her great slipper story of Mary Stewart. Do you have uh, Mary Stewart and Larry Haynes memories? Oh wow. I well they just I mean Mary see Michael was a seasoned pro by the time he started on search. I was still kind of green, I have to say, and uh, I learned so much from from not only Mary and Larry, but also from Marie. And Marie was the queen of lighting. Like I had a lot of scenes with her and, and we'd be, you know, rehearsing and she'd be like sort of, you know, yeah. huh? I, I, it was, it's really all about, you know, when you're so busy focused on the scene, you're not thinking that you're in somebody else's light because the light's over here, the light's over here. Yeah. And then Mary, I remember um, you had to learn to hold an emotion at the end of the scene. Like when they, fade to black. Oh, yeah. You're acting, you're not used to doing that. So, you know, I learned, she taught me how to do that. You know, you have to hold whatever it is you're thinking or feeling until they yell cut. Yeah. Stuff like that. And Larry just, you know, was just priceless. Do you remember all of his little practical jokes? Oh, he was, a, he was such a cut up and so funny. And he was really, he's really delightful. The two of them were, but, listen, they were, they were soap opera royalty. Yes. And when you get to come on, and we were young, you know, we came on the show, and they they were legends already. So just coming in and working with them was was really it was really a gift. It was really amazing. Right, and the fact that you know Mary took the time to to take me aside as a mm -hmm. green little and say, look, you know, it's going to be much more effective if you just hold that thought until. Mm -hmm. And I okay. It's funny, as you're saying that, I can hear her voice. Yeah. She you know, funny. She loved she, she, mentor. she loved, you know, she loved having, you know, younger younger castmates around to, to educate because she, at that point, I think when I started, she'd already been on the show for probably, you know, almost 30 years or yeah. 27 or something. And she was a kid when she started. Yeah. So, 
Um, yeah. So, it, it, you know, there was some, I learned so much. I really felt like, particularly for the first couple of years, I, I was being paid to learn. And then after, you know, you get into a rhythm. And, uh, but it was just, what an amazing opportunity I had. I just still can't even believe it. Yeah. And and staying till the end, what was that like, Marsha, when, you, you know, learning that the show was going to be canceled? It's got to be, you know, when you put that much love into it, kind of devastating. Well, you know, it really, it was, I, I don't know what, sh what uh, state the show was in when you left, Michael, but it was really, uh, it was really hard because every week you were hearing it was going to be canceled. Yeah. Every, every cycle, every, you know, it was almost like you were just waiting. And when they brought in the last producer, who was this guy? Yeah, I was still there when they, but well, I was there with Joanna Lee, first Mary Ellen Bunham, Mary Alice Bunham, yeah. and then, um, then Joanna Lee, who to me was just the best producer ever. Fabulous. She's and the one then, live show. Yeah, she's the one who, she was brilliant. She was brilliant. She with big red hair. She was like a cross between Lucille Ball and ah, yeah. she was amazing. Yeah, she and then they brought in Ellen Barrett, and that was the last producer I had. So was there someone after Ellen? Well, there was a guy. He, he was a very well. Then they had Nick Nicholson. Oh yeah, Nick Nicholson. <laughs> I, I love the name. Between he was lovely, but he was he was the edge of night forever and. Uh, and of course, John Weitzel was in there. We had, it was almost like the producer du jour. I think the last, yeah. we had so many. And the problem was because none of them had a real investment in the show and everybody thought they had to redo everything to make it. Mm -hmm. more. So I sort of, I sensed the death knell was coming when we had uh, David Lawrence come in at the end. Not that he wasn't a perfectly nice guy. But, um, and I remember the day that they canceled the show because I had been doing a commercial with David Forsyth out in New Jersey, a fruit and fiber commercial. I didn't really do any, but that was one that I got with him. And I was, it was a long day and it was boring because you're just doing the same thing over and over. And I'm going, oh, this is, I'm so glad I'm going to work tomorrow because this was really not, you know, really uh, I mean, it was great to get the royalties, but it's a lot of sitting around. And at least when you're working in the daytime, you're, you know, you if you're not, doing something, you're learning your lines or your whatever. But anyway, so that night, Halloween, David Lawrence called to tell me that the show was canceled. And I was yeah. But it was almost like somebody you love is dying and you're just waiting for the phone call when it's gonna, they're, you're gonna find out that they're actually gone. That's when they pull the plug, yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of shows, it's like World Turns and Guiding Light and One Life to Live and All My Children, I think, lived with those rumors for many years, or at least as the World Turns and Guiding Light, I know did, for sure. It's, mm -hmm. it's very, it's it's really hard because you do love it and you do care and, and you, you don't invest any less in it, whether the show's not doing well or not, but you know that it's, it's only a matter of time. Yeah. Wow. So, Michael, what was it like going from a half hour, because both Ryan's Hope and Search were half, to then go go to Genoa City to play David Kimball? Oh, boy. Well, twice as many lines. <laughs> um, but the good news is, I, you know, I've been doing it for a while, so I, I, that didn't kill me um, going from a half hour to an hour. And, um, and everybody was so lovely on that show. I started on that one with a, a, a very famous woman at the time, um, Brenda Dixon. Yeah, um, I love, I love both. both. Both ladies were amazing as Jill. Oh yeah, and then Jill, um, Jess Walton, yeah. Yeah. again, is another dear friend of mine. She was just over for dinner two nights ago. Um, we just, you know, we, we've been very close friends now for whatever, 30 years. Um, so it was a great environment to go into. And the Bells, Bill Bell, what, a, I mean, could not have been more gracious to me, wrote me amazing stories. Uh, I had great people to work with there too. So it was it was an easy transition. I had moved here, I moved out here to California for it and never left. So I'm still here. So it was it was fantastic. So they killed your character they in a trash compactor? Can okay, so here's the story. Yeah. <laughs> I know people ask about this all yeah, the time. I, I, wait, I told I told Michael that the fans were all discussing if David Kimball was still alive. So okay. here, here we go. Here's the scoop. So okay. David Kimball was being chased by uh, Nina and Danny Romilotti and Cricket and all that. So he climbs into this trash compactor to hide. And accidentally, somehow, the, the on button oh, gets hit. 
So all you see is David going into the trash. Then time, you know, time passes a few minutes later, and then somebody's hand gets sort of spit out in a in a bale of something. Now, the theory is is that there may have been a homeless person who was sleeping in the trash compactor. David snuck out the back. They never identified the body. They never identified the hand. David Kimball may still be out there. Oh my gosh. So it has come up in conversations over time about hmm, uh, what would happen if he ended up showing up again. So we'll see. Okay, well. I, I think that fans need need to write in. I think the Absolutely, because they just had my wife on there, Nina, came in, and then the kid that I was trying to basically take over all his money is now a, a detective. So there's a lot of great storyline crossover. I didn't realize you were married to Nina. I love Nina. Uh, yeah. I watched that show ages ago. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was. I was married to her because I wanted to kill her. So... <laughs> Um, I didn't sleep at night, Michael. Can you, can you see that? <laughs> oh, Lisa Peluso and I. Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Marsha, you and I. Um, oh, with, um, wait! I have to put my glasses. Jeffrey, Jeff, Jeffrey Meek. Jeff, Jeff oh, Meek. Jeff Meek. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Stephen Bergman just sent those to Jeff. me. The world turns. Uh, I suggested him to uh, Chris Gatlin to be um, on As the World Turns, and I'm trying to remember the character that he played, but it did not. Work. Yeah, the actor name sounds familiar to me. Did did he play a character? He he was on As the World Turns. Yeah, uh, I, I I know the name is sounding yeah. familiar to me. Okay. Hey, did you want to give a shout out, Michael? I want to give a shout out to to really. All, everybody that's that's participating in all the search for tomorrow fan sites um, it's it's so exciting for me to see the postings I mean there are some postings on there that I look and I go oh my god I don't yeah. even remember that there was one just recently where it was a picture of Gene Petragallo and then Cindy Gibb and me and we were on a deserted island and of course you know, my shirts were everybody's got ripped shirt. And I thought to myself, I don't even remember. It's incredible. Burlap sacks. Man, that was crazy. So it's so wonderful yeah. seeing all that stuff. So thank you to everybody that posts all that. That's really they amazing. Yeah, they, 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 I can... they saved all that material. And during they the pandemic, they showed some amazing videos during the pandemic. It, it, I don't even, and apparently the, the person that they got them from now is not allowing them to be shown, but there were all kinds of things like oh, just really? spanning many, many years and they were really fun to see. So thank you. And, and, you know, Chad, Chad Dancer and Alan Brown and Roche and all the yeah. people that are so passionate about the show. My friend, Lisa Miller, who I went to college with is, is a, a big supporter of Search for Tomorrow Memories. And she's a brilliant actress in her own right and singer. And uh, just, it's been such a gift to be a part of this. And I thank you all so much. Well, and it's so funny, you know, as I was preparing this, you know, Chad sent me some pictures because, you know, Search ended long before the, the web was as robust as, as it is now. And to find those pictures online, it's not as easy to find quality pictures. So a lot of people have scanned, you know, the magazines and they, you know, they're sharing all of that, which is really fun, fun to I see. Will, I will admit, I do believe I have probably 45 hours of Search for Tomorrow in too. a box and on videotape. The, and VHS. VHS. Yes, VHS. <laughs> I have it in trunks. I, I just moved. I was telling Alan, I just moved out of the city and I have a, finally have access to a storage closet that I'm going to move into my house here. And I'm going to start, I'll post some stuff because I do, I have, I have trunks full of magazines. Oh, fans, yeah. fans would love that. Fans would love that. Um, hey, Marcia, how old are Yvonne and Nick now? 
Oh, good memory. Uh, well, my darling daughter is uh, 28, and uh, she'll be 29 in January, and my son Nick is 24. And Have they followed in either yours or Chris's footsteps? Well, uh, my son actually, uh, he's getting his uh, master's in social work at NYU, but he's very much involved in wrestling. And he actually uh, co-produced a wrestling event in uh, Flemington, New Jersey last weekend. Oh, right family out there. It was, I went, it was three and a half hours of great entertainment. And he produced it with this other guy and it was well attended. And my daughter um, has her master's in educational theater. She started out as a, wanting to be a singer, BFA musical theater. She went to Emerson in Boston, oh. um, Michael. She loved it, but she right. just decided to get off the performing track, but she's a teacher. Unfortunately, doesn't have a job now because of COVID, but is hoping to, uh, she just moved back to the city from Colorado. So they're both in the city and um, love them to death. My best you know, the best thing I ever did in my life was to have those kids, and I feel so blessed every day that I have them. So, and, uh, I can't believe that that I remember Nick running around the world term studio. Yeah, well, <laughs> he's, yeah, he's they're, they're both great, and they're both very much New Yorkers and very happy, and yeah. So, oh. yeah. Michael, how did your career? Well, first of all, you've written three best selling real estate books, correct? Yeah. What, where where did the the love of real estate come from? I, you know, all the time I was on soap operas, I was always buying houses. So I started when I was on Ryan's Hope and I bought my first little house. I got a, like an extra 20 grand and I bought the house next door to my grandmother's and I fixed wow. it up and I flipped it. And so for the rest of my life, I've been buying properties and fixing them up and flipping them. And and uh, Random House came to me at one point and just said, you know, why don't you write a book about this? So I wrote a book that was very successful called Find It, Fix It, Flip It. And um, and I've written a couple of books since about real estate and, you know, had a, had a show on HGTV and all kinds of stuff real estate related. So it's it's kind of my, my side passion always has been real estate. And I think yeah. during this time, I mean, people's homes are really have become like their sanctuaries. I think people are oh. so much more time at home and putting so much yeah. work and effort. So I've never done it professionally, but I, I renovated for our family and mm -hmm. like six or, I've done six or seven major projects too. I combined three apartments in Manhattan when my, you know, kids were little to, for our family home, which we did very well on when we sold it. And I've done three places in Florida and I'm going to work on this place here. And I did a studio. I mean, you know, I'm not for, for other people, but for me, right. um, yeah. but Hey, you know, it's, 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 a it, well, it starts with you. And then like, you know, I know a lot of people who've done what you've done, Michael, but wow. Um, do you do the work yourself sometimes? Well, a lot of times I always have, a, I always have good crews. I mean, I probably have flipped now like 30, 30 something houses um, wow. over over time and um people will probably do another one in the next year and 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 then i also was teaching flipping and uh i was you know hired by i i then do all the real estate stuff that's how i ended up on extra because they came to me and said geez you're really interested you, you really got a passion for real estate and luxury lifestyle and i said yeah and so they said well we're going to just hire you at extra to be a host and that'll be your your expertise. So now it's been what, 13, 14 years I'm at Extra? And as two Emmys? One of the hosts. Wow. And two Emmys from, from Extra? And, and sorry? Is it two Emmys from Extra that you? Yeah. Three, four nominations and two Emmys. So. Wow, bravo. Yeah. Did you ever think um, anywhere along your career path was hosting anything you ever you know, back in the day, you know, back when we were all in the 80s, like Marcia said, we, you know, we were always doing a lot of commercials and I was always doing a lot of spokesman stuff anyway. But the nice thing about hosting is I, is it taught me how to become a producer. Um, and so I now I'm also I'm a host, but I'm also a senior supervising producer for Mansions and Millionaires, um, which is my sort of spinoff from Extra. And from that, I've learned how to produce. And now I'm, I'm executive producing a couple of new series on other networks. So that's pretty great. So it was a skill I had, I learned. 
Um, what is it like going into those homes? I'm sure Marsha, like me, I would love to see some of those homes in person. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. I get, you know, it's the greatest gig in the world. I get to travel all over the world. I go to the finest hotels, the finest homes um, all over the world, and somebody pays me to do it. So it's been an amazing um, journey. I, I love it. I mean, unfortunately, during COVID, it's kind of sucks because of all the shows that we were going to be shooting last year in, in the Maldives and in Paris and everything, forget it. But next year, maybe next year. Yeah, fingers, fingers crossed. crossed. Marsha, some fans were asking, what do you remember about the Henderson flood, if you don't mind? Oh, my God. Well, wow. now, Michael, were you there for that? No, I was. That was right after I left, I think. Yeah. Was Ellen Barrett decided to have a big flood and clean slate, I think, if I remember. Yeah. Um, no, you know, I think that was John Weitzel, actually. Oh, was it? Okay. I believe John Weitzel um, and Gary Tomlin. It was, oh, Gary. It was, it was, it was very dramatic. I, I remember um, it was really, it was a very hard shoot because it was cold and, you know, it, you were wet and everyone was running around, you know, with towels trying to warm you up. And poor Mary Stewart did not know how to swim, which I didn't find out until after we finished shooting. Oh my God. Yeah. She did not know how to swim. And they had her in like a tank of water pretending to drown. And the, the reality is she, she probably could have, if she had, I mean, she does not know how to swim. So it was, it was, it was, but it was really, uh, it was, it was a very small cast. It, there was only about 10 of us that were involved in it. It was uh, Hogan, Patty, Mary, me, you know, like eight, eight or nine of us. And it was, and then we all moved to this like hotel for a while. I remember I had this, I had this cute, I was dressed as a bellhop for a week. That was the only clothing they could find for me in this hotel. So, but it was, it was a very, um, you know, it, it was a, it was a very, I thought it was a very successful shoot. Um, I don't know if the after part of the story really did much for the ratings, but it, it was, I think it was a really well done achievement and certainly uh, very challenging for everyone involved from the directors to the producers, to the actors, everybody. That's a flood in daytime is challenging. I mean, challenging in 2020, I can't imagine in yeah. somewhere in the eighties. <laughs> a lot of they spent a lot of money on it as well yeah because, i mean i think the audience en enjoyed it i think it is uh, weird when they do those things that are a little out of the box uh -huh. like like a flood or you know and and i'm putting a challenge out there to anybody that's that's listening put it post it online why were we in the tropics fleeing gun runners i cannot for the life of me remember that storyline, but apparently we were. So if anybody can remind me what that was, I'll, I'll, I'll read it while we're, we're talking. Um, one of the fans, Jeffrey, was asking, Michael, um, are you still with the Hollywood Medium show that you created? Yes. Um, so I created a show called uh, Hollywood Medium with Tyler Henry, if anybody knows who that is. He's a, um, was at the time an 18-year-old medium. He talks to the dead. And trust me, I'm the biggest skeptic there is, but the, what he does is just, you can't explain it. So I, I discovered him and I created the show and I sold that show to E and uh, we've got, we've done four seasons so far. Uh, we're in the middle of shooting the next season at a bigger network. Oh. Then, shh, okay. That's all I can say. Nice. But literally, I'm le I, right from here, I'm going now to go, I was telling you guys, I'm going to go get a COVID test because I'm on set for Tyler's new show tomorrow. Um, so you can look for that coming out next year, but I can't tell you oh, where. I, I spent some time because um, John Edward, you know, oh, cool. it was a Guiding Light fan. And so we did a... Um, I can't remember. I think it was I created. We we took everybody to his show. He did something with Guiding Light. I can't remember now because it's so long ago. Wow. But it is it is fascinating, and I agree. There is reason to be skeptical of of people, but when you see it in person, mm -hmm. it, it 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 is like truly a mind blowing experience to witness it. Yeah, it's it's undeniable when you see it because we do. I also produce Tyler's tour 
around the country, which obviously isn't happening right now. Mm -hmm. When you see him in front of 2,000 people and he's calling out names and, and events and things, it's just, you can't, I, I, I don't know how to explain it. Well, he's 22 now, is that? He's, 20, he's 23 now. 23. How, yeah. where, how, where does that come from at somebody so young? I don't know when John Edwards started, but that, my God, 18 years old. Yeah, it's crazy, right? You so, how, how did you how did you find him? I literally I met him at a Christmas party. He was 17 years old, and someone introduced him and said, Hey, um, you should meet that kid over there. He was bullied and and you know, kind of harassed in high school, and he had to drop out and to get homeschooling. And oh, by the way, he talks to the dead. And I was like, what? So I went over and said. Oh, Michael. Please. I had him come over and give me a reading the next day, and he blew me away. So I, oh, am I back? Did yeah. he channel? Did he channel? Am I frozen? That you loved, Michael? When oh, you I see Marsha froze. Oh, did he channel? Oh, I froze. Did he channel somebody that you loved, Michael? when he came over to your house? Uh, no, Michael, I think for us, uh, there you go. Did he cheer uh, your loved ones when he came to your house? Uh, uh, there he is. Uh, I just, I'm switching to a different Wi-Fi. How's that, is that better? I can hear you. You haven't, it hasn't. Uh, How's that? I can hear you. Yeah, there you go. There you okay. go. Marsha, Marsha was asking, did he um, speak to somebody that was close to you? Oh, yeah. Um, it, it was he he told me exactly how some people passed, exactly who they were. I mean, it was just it, it was undeniable. So I I signed him to a deal and created a show and sold it. And here we are. So it's he's pretty amazing. He's an amazing kid and the nicest kid ever. Super nice. That's great. Um, one of the fans said that your character was a gun runner, and that's how he was so rich. But once you got mu once you got busted, you lost all your money. Really? Isn't that wild? I don't remember the gun runner part. <laughs> <laughs> remember you had that sidekick, Ringo? Was that when you were a journalist? Yes! <laughs> Ringo, Larry Fleischman. He was hysterical. Wow, that's good, Marshall. That was great. Yeah. No, I love Larry. He was just oh, Larry. tell whoever that was. Thank you, because yes, okay, now yeah. I remember. I, I don't have their name, but it's FYI. So FYI, thank you for that. Um, yeah, that's, that's great. great. Oh my God, that's funny. Oh, I had some great stories. We all did. We had amazing stories on daytime. You you get to experience so many amazing stories and interactions, and it's it's a it's a great medium. What what did you learn from daytime? How to memorize lines. Oh God! Yeah. Um, how to find your light. Um, thank you, Marie. Thank you. <laughs> um, and the di and discipline, because there's no room for prima donnas. Prima donnas. There's no room for um, not working together as a team. There's no room for stars. You're you're. It's a team ensemble effort every single day. And and you're also. I also learned you're. Everybody's replaceable. There's nobody too good to not be replaced. Hmm. Yeah. You know, the discipline part, I mean, so I think when we were uh, doing daytime, we were all living like nuns and monks. I mean, you would literally go home, you'd have a little something to eat, and you'd start learning lines for the next day. So yeah. during the 20s and, and like early to mid 30s, I, 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 didn't, I didn't go out. I'd go out on the weekends occasionally, but most, of, most nights I was at home. I was pouring over my lines, and you have to go to bed because you're yeah. Five in the morning, and you know that was it. It was, it was certainly wonderful, but it was not. Uh, you know, people think it's gla it's glamorous, certainly at times, but it's really very, very hard work. It's like doing factory work in a way because you can't really think about what you did today because you're worrying about tomorrow. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you have to forget. You forget yeah. what you did today. tomorrow. <laughs> you have to let those yeah. lines go so you can get the other lines in. It's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it, it was hard, but God, I, I mean, I, I, I just loved every minute of it, but it, you know, so when search actually went off the air, I, I was on for almost nine years. I took, I took a year and a half off. I just needed, I was exhausted. I just needed, yeah. 
Um, and, and then I, you went to One Life after that. I was on One Life. Um, I was on. I, I was only on for a year. I was very disappointed because I I I love the character, but they had this very intricate baby switching story that um, Paul Rash assured me it had nothing to do with me. He said it was just you know we have to kill your character because you know you're going to die in childbirth and your baby's going to be switched with this other thing and. But I, that was a great that was a great part, and um, I, I I was really thrilled to be a part. They were very nice, and the best thing about One Life was it was a half a block from my apartment, so I would yeah. literally go home. You know, I'd say to David, the guard, like I'm going I'm going to my dressing room for lunch. You know, <laughs> and uh, no, and they they were lovely. The whole cast and Dennis Parlato was. And Fiona Hutchinson, I'm still uh, friends with. She's oh. actually the acting teacher at York Prep where my son graduated. So she's- Oh yeah, yeah. I, I talked to Fiona quite a bit. She's yeah. doing great there. Um, and you were there for Eterna, right? Yeah, oh God, that was a crazy story. <laughs> that was a crazy story. Like, I don't know, I don't know who thought that one, the underground city under <laughs> Eterna. Yeah, but but I listen. I I loved working with Dennis. He was um, he he's a Broadway did a lot of Broadway stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of, yeah. He came to Guiding Light temporarily to uh, fill the place of uh, I think when Chris Bruno passed away. If I'm not mistaken, oh. yeah, possibly. He's a lovely actor. And Michael, you worked with Louis Schaefer over at Ryan's Hope, and then over at Search. I did. I love I love Louise. I used to tell this one funny story when I first started on the show that I would go in and we would do, back in the old days, you would go in and you'd rehearse everything first and then you would go onto the set. So in the mornings, there was always this woman who was there with the curlers and, you know, big, huge, huge glasses. All glasses, right, yeah. yeah. Unrecognizable. And, and then I'd go into tape in the afternoon and out would, would walk this stunningly beautiful woman. And I went up to her one day and I said, I said, I, I said, you're so amazing. I said, they don't, they don't make you rehearse, do they? <laughs> and said, Honey, are you kidding? I, that's me in the morning. <laughs> no idea. For like my first three weeks on the show that that was Louise. I just thought because she was the grand dame that she never had to rehearse. Um, <laughs> she was like Grace Keller. <laughs> I never knew it was her in the mornings. <laughs> that is a great story. Thank God for the wizards in the makeup in the makeup. Yeah. I mean, I don't have to worry about that. But us, us ladies, boy, we were eternally grateful to them. And remember, uh, jo Joel. Uh, Joel. Uh, Thurm. No, no. What was his name? Joel. Uh, he was. There. Our makeup artist, who was the nicest man. He was Joel. the best. He was there forever. Yeah. He was just an amazing makeup artist, yeah. Oh, my God. I haven't even thought of him, Marcia, for the longest time, but what an amazing guy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. You can't live without those people, right? No. Yeah, especially when they're really, really wonderful people. I wish I had one of them today. <laughs> hey, are you kidding? You look fabulous. Everyone is saying how beautiful and you look exactly like you did. That's wow. funny. So thank you. Thank you. You look fantastic. A uh, decade or, or four. <laughs> what'd you say? I said give or take a decade or four. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like? You got to work with Lawrence Lau and Van Hansis, Marsha, on uh, World Turns. You played um La did you get oh. to work with Lawrence or did you work that that was a that was a one day. It was a really um, oh okay, yeah. And in fact, it was a great, it was a great story. What was this back then? Weren't you? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It was a one. It, her name was Carolyn Wheatley, and she was the um, she was the ex wife of of this uh, gentleman who was thought to be uh, playing for the other team, who was who was romancing Lucinda, and they were trying right. to figure out what the deal was with him. So she was she was. Um, uh, sort of accosted by her grandson to try to find out what was going on outside her office. It was, a, it, I wish, you know, if it had been a real character, it was just right. like a one day kind of thing, but it was fun. I mean, it was fun to do it. And it was again, filmed like 
you know, three seconds from where I live. So that was so that. That's the best. Yeah. Would you both go back to daytime if the right role came about? I would actually. There were about a month ago, maybe, 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 yeah, about a month ago, I got a call on a Thursday night from my agent, and he said, "I think I'm putting you on hold for General Hospital starting on Monday. Can you do it?" And I'm like, "Wow!" And he said, "So they're going to decide tomorrow. They're going to decide tomorrow. They just wanted to, you know, give you a heads up." So I just recently, so I forget who it is that got the role. But it's somebody well known that I just noticed just got a role. Uh, Gregory Harrison. Oh, uh, I oh, wouldn't be surprised. Okay. I wouldn't be surprised if that's what it was. But I mean, I don't know if it's the same role, but I do know that Gregory Harrison just joined. Yeah, yeah. It, that could be what it, it was. So damn you, Gregory. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I would go. I would. Go, I'd love to go back and finish up David Kimball oh. at Young Restless. Oh, and, I mean, you just wrote a great story. That hand coming out. Oh yeah, I, easy breezy. I've been in hiding all this time. I got my face back to normal after it was all disfigured, yeah. and, uh, and I'm going back in for the final revenge. <laughs> Why not? That's a nice thing. I mean, the nice thing about being on a show that's still on the air is there's always that option. I mean, mm -hmm. unfortunately, the, the shows, all the shows that I've done, I've done, yeah. they're all gone. Yeah. I did Another world. I did all my children. One, they're all gone. Sir. Yeah. So. Would I go back? Well, I haven't acted in such a long time that uh, I, I would have to do a little brush up, but I, I would certainly consider it. I mean, I, you know, they're just not writing for mature women right now. Um, and most of the women that are fortunate enough to be on, you know, the four shows that are still on are still gorgeous. They've been there for, yeah, for 30 years and been there. And it really does, um, it's an unfortunate thing that they are no longer any uh, daytime shows in New York City. Yeah, yeah. it's terrible. Just for the, just for the whole um, industry as a large, you know, all those Broadway actors who would work in the daytime as mm -hmm. you know, day players on the show and go, I mean, you were doing it, you know, Michael, you were doing the, the show during the day and, and Broadway at night, day, yeah. Broadway at night. We had some incredible guest stars on the show. I mean, an inc I mean incredible, Regulars. I mean, we had Anita Gillette who did Broadway. We had Olympia Dukakis. We had um, Shirley Ralph. This actor, you know, Peter Weller was a, was an extra on um, on Search, and I saw him in the I saw him in the uh, in the jury. We, we were doing a courtroom story, and I said, "Wait a minute, that's Peter Weller. I just saw him in a movie over the weekend." And I I went up to him and I said, "What are you doing here? You're in." <laughs> I needed a day for my insurance. I said, oh, okay, well, welcome. Welcome to Henderson. You know, it was really funny. Yeah. And he and I are still friends, actually, because of that. But no, we had such a wonderful parade of people that came in and out. And music. Oh, amazing. amazing. David David Roush, uh, uh, um, uh, John Glover, who's yeah. massively successful, brilliant actor. Uh, Shirley Ralph. Will Patton. Um, Will so Patton. many amazing people. You mentioned Jane earlier, Jane Krakowski, Jane, and Jane. she was a teenager, right? Wasn't she like a teenager when she was on Search? She was probably 15, I think, at the yeah. time. Her character was named T.R., which stood for Teenage Runaway. That was her. T.R., oh my God, that's right. Yeah. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. I, I remember watching her, but I didn't remember what her character name was. Yeah. Before I let you go, I know, Sonny, uh, G.T. Lem, one of our fans, was asking, do you know why they broke up Sonny and Hogan? Because a lot of fans think that that was such a great relationship and they feel like it was... Uh... Well, you know, I think what happened was the, the character of Liza was sort of the, you know, she was the really the queen. She was really the leading lady sort of at the end of the run of the show. Not that Mary wasn't beloved and but, you know, so everything was all about Liza. So I think they decided that they wanted to get uh, David together with her character because they thought it would be sort of, she didn't have a love interest. You know, Rod was killed. Oh, Rod right, Lawrence. Uh, the Travis character was killed. And they tried her with, you know, uh, uh, Peter Haskell and all these other people. But I think they wanted to go in that direction. So. That didn't work out, and then they brought Patty on, you know, Mary's uh, mm -hmm. daughter. So then they got Hogan with Patty, and then at the end of the show, they got together, and, and they, uh, the grand finale was their wedding in Ireland. And I 
they got me involved with uh, Lee Goddard, who played Bella Garowdy. So at least I didn't go off the air as an old maid, but um, <laughs> I, wish, I wish they kept David and I together. We had so much fun together. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I've, I've seen it a lot from the fans. They, they all seem to yeah. have uh, liked We're still good friends, and, you know, we, we just really, um, we had a really good chemistry. We have a good chemistry as friends, so that. That's right. Yeah. Um, I, I've been asking a lot of people um, during, you know, quarantine and COVID. Have you learned anything about yourself that you hadn't already known? Wow. Uh, yeah, I think the one thing I've learned, I've learned, is that it's I'm okay um, slowing down for a minute because I'm very type A. I always have been and very much a workaholic and so when you just can't be uh it was okay i'm i was down in palm springs for almost four months and doing everything by by uh virtually and i kind of like getting up in the morning and going bicycle riding first thing in the morning every morning and not feeling guilty about it so stuff like that i think that's what i learned for me a little bit of balance mm. marcia I just, I feel that uh, I've always had a deep and abiding appreciation and love for my friends and my home and everything. But I think this just sort of took it to another level. Like it's, you just feel so grateful. And I think about, um, you know, we're very fortunate. We have, you know, I have a beautiful home to live in. I think about all, all the people that, you know, were living paycheck to paycheck who couldn't afford to put food on the table for their families. There's just, I mean, we're so blessed and I feel so badly for so many people that were not as um, in such a good position because it was just really terrible. And people that were homeschooled, I mean, I have two children now. My kids were home and I was trying to homeschool them and, and, you know, keep food on the table and I didn't have a job. I mean, you know, we're just so lucky. Tough, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have such an, and I respect so, so much people that have, uh, young children today because they're going, this is a whole nother level of anxiety and a level of stress. I, I, I could not imagine having to to educate children from home, you know, while you're also doing your job possibly for, yeah. for most for most we're people. Trying to. Yeah, the ice we're trying to. Yeah, exactly. You know, all kids yeah. want to be with each other and you know they can't be, you know, it's no. very, it's just awful. So I feel incredibly appreciative, incredibly grateful, um, and just, you know, very empathetic for other people who are not as fortunate. So hopefully yeah. the vaccine will come soon. Well, my last question, what does the legacy of search mean to each of you, Michael? Wow. Um, I mean, for me, I guess the legacy is that it was, it was some really, really great storytelling. And obviously, by the fact that we're now, how many, how many years later? Well, that's not me. Is that me? Is that, is that yeah. Also, if your agent calling, they, <laughs> want you on, they want you on Days of Our Lives right now. Um, <laughs> no, I think the fact that we're however many 35 years later talking about the the show means it, it really meant a lot to a lot of people at the time. And um, it had some really great storytelling and some really wonderful people. And I think that's the legacy of that is um, those characters that we were so invested in back then are still kind of with us in many ways. So I, I, they're I think still invested. In television. The, the, these fans tuning in today are still very much invested. So, yeah. you know, yeah, it's it fantastic. A, it was a groundbreaking show. I mean, it was one of the oldest. And I think that, you know, the seeds were sown during, you know, search and guiding light for the, for the daytime drama. Of course, we all know that Charles Dickens really started it with, you know, his every day something different and the continuing story. But I mean, day, daytime dramas and look look at the shows today that are still. I mean, so many shows are are, are based on continuing dramas. You know, mm -hmm. well, this is us. I'm going to watch it. I think it's a great show. Um, but I think that the legacy is um, the characters will live on. You know, unfortunately, the show went off before a lot of stuff was, they threw out all the search tapes, which I think is really tragic. I heard that they cleaned out, some PNG cleaned out some warehouse and got mm. search tapes somehow. It, that, that is a shame because uh, people would be 
paying for that on some streaming platform. Oh, it could easily be streaming today, for sure. But, but but look at I mean I remember when I was a kid the show that I loved to watch was Dark Shadows. I used to come home. Oh, oh my God! I want I just love that show. And, and you know, once you establish a love of, of the continuing drama, it, it, there's it just is embedded in your soul. I still remember the characters from, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean I that's how I ended up working in soaps. I mean I I grew up watching. Did so, you ever watch soaps, Michael? Um, I don't I don't think I was really. I never really watched them that much before I started doing them. Um, I just never did my, my, you know, in those days it was whoever was in the home was watching them. And I don't think my mom um, really ever watched them. And my dad was always at work. So they weren't really on in the home um, when I grew up. So I, I wasn't, no, but once I, once I was on them, <laughs> <laughs> they were watching, they were watching. They were my whole family watching every day. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm sorry for the late start to everybody who's watching right now. Uh, we'll try to get Marie back when her camera is working. <laughs> oh, Alan, thank you so much. Really, for thank you for putting this together. This is great. You're so, cool to see Marsha. Oh, you're see so you. welcome. I'm going to sign off. We can say goodbye in a second. Thanks, everybody, for tuning okay. in. Okay. Thank you.